Yeah, it's good evening, everyone. So today we'll be talking about the EVM um the Ethereum virtual machine. So we won't we won't really be coding along today for today's class. So I get that things might get a little bit boring. But just try and follow along and pick whatever you can pick. So yeah, let's go. Yeah, so um I also assume like um all we is already to code. Even if it's not something complex, even if it's just a single function or something we've all written. And we've all written and um, to assume we've all used solidity. The other languages as well that we can use when we are writing, now we are building an application for the Ethereum blockchain. Um, there is Viper, there is Yor and everything, but like solidity is the most, is the one that is used mostly. So, um, yeah, um, you guys are hearing me right. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. okay cool. So um whenever I write a code in solidity, we'll have something like this code dot dot sol five. The dot sol is the solidity extension and then we'll compile it. Um most of us have used Remix. So Remix has a compiler that we we'll use. And whenever we compile we get um the byte code. So the, the byte code you get the byte code and we get the API. API is called on um, the application binary interface. It's just like an interface that defines the smart contracts. The inter the API contains the all the functions that are in the smart contracts, the functions, the function arguments, the function and the return values and everything. So it's just it just defines the function interface so that any um, any application that wants to interact with the smart contract knows the exact function that the contract contains knows the arguments that each function requires and type of the arguments and then we have the we have the binary we have the this byte code so the byte code um solidity is a high level language right and whenever after it's our solidity the compiler compiles it to a byte code so it is it is the byte code that the EVM actually understands not the byte code exactly the, just the byte code um contains like the the opcodes and uh, the upcodes, uh, call data, call data, everything that will be used. So that is what gets, that is what is sent to the EVM. And that is what the EVM, but the, the EVM doesn't understand our solidity file. The EVM understands its upcodes, which is basically um, the byte code that we get after after compiling the contract. So very soon I'll try and like open the mix and I will compile the code and we see like, um, so we see the byte code. That, that, is, that is the value that actually gets sent to the EVM. This is the so now um, let's let's move on. Yeah, so solidity is only one EVM language. Viper is another language that is used as well for writing solidity smart contracts. Yeah, so um, yeah. So after writing our code, um okay. so Whenever I send a transaction to the blockchain, if any of us have sent a transaction to the blockchain before, there are some fields that the transaction contains. So uh, those fields like describe what this transaction is doing, describes who the transaction is coming from, um, where is the transaction being sent to, those other things. So this this nonce is is a transa transaction nonce. Um, it's different from an account nonce. So, well, accounts, all addresses in Solidity, they all have their, I mean, in Ethereum blockchain, they all have their nonce. Nonce is basically like the number of transactions that has been sent from a particular address. If I create a new address right now, the nonce will be zero. So, and for every transaction that is sent with this, for every transaction that, that is sent with this address, the nonce will be, will be incremented by one. But this is kind of different. The, the nonce here is a, is different from the account nonce. This one is the transaction nonce. But transaction nonce was used was really used when Ethereum was still running proof of work, um, consensus, upgrade mechanism. Now um, the root it has been transitioned to post stick. So this nonce, if you check any transaction, the nonce that you see there, I think it's going to be just zero 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 zero. So for now, we just ignore this nonce. So let's 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 talk about the gas price. Um, do we understand what gas? Can anybody like just explain what gas is? 
in context of Ethereum. So, so it's interjected. Um, yeah. The non spark, right? Um, yeah. Can you mention sure proof of work, right? So, so okay, we're talking about transaction nodes now, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I think the proof of work nodes, right? Yeah. Is different from um the transaction ones. Am I right? Um, go to that right? Um, does anybody have um something to say about that? So does anybody have an idea about that? Okay. Um. So I think I think they are different. I think they are different. So um, but it's not. I don't think they are different. It's not. It's like um. Number it's always used when calculating the block difficulty or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the people of work formerly for work laws was used to be block difficulty. Yeah, general right. yeah, laws is different for visual action laws. Yeah, yeah, so they are different. So this transaction was like is different from that. Now that is no longer useful because we have left people for work to for stick for it there. But in terms of transaction laws, it's still like being used to get like yeah. Yes, you can maybe check that out about the class. Yeah. Okay, so now the gas price. Uh, I was asking, I was saying, can anyone like um, explain what gas is or uh, what gas is used for something? And does anyone have any idea? I think uh, the, the gas price is used for like amounts that you pay to be able to send the transaction or send the transaction to the blockchain. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's um, last correct kind of not totally correct. So um this this gas price is like um the price per unit of gas no for each transaction. Okay. So for each transaction there is we spend there is an amount of gas that we use want with the unit doing this kind of falling here and is affecting yeah, so for each um transaction there is an amount of gas that is required to run the transaction and that that gas is calculated by um if we're calling the smart contract function the gas required to run that function is kind of like so for for all the um, depends on whatever the function is doing. There is no um, universal amount, like there is no universal gas fee or something. So the gas depends on whatever function you are calling. Now, each each we are talking about the um, byte code and um, EVM opcode recently. We just talked about EVM opcode. So the EVM opcode, EVM has several opcodes around the one fifty or so. Add push um, hash, lot of lot of opcodes. So each opcode have they have the gas associated to it. For example, the, the add up code takes three, three units of gas. So that means in the if there's as in the is there's a function and the only thing they are doing in the function is just to add, then it's going to take now anytime you want a transaction, there is a twenty-one thousand gas that is like basically like that twenty-one thousand gas is there for any transaction you are paying that twenty-one thousand gas. So the total gas for a transaction is now going to be the twenty-one thousand gas plus whatever gas is required to run a function. So for functions that are really complex that contains a lot of things, um S2, S2, a lot of those ones take a lot more gas because there are, there are some operations that are more expensive than the other ones. Some some operations are simple, you don't take a lot of gas, but some ones consume like S2 for an example, they are writing for to storage location for the first time, it takes around twenty thousand gas. But that one is way expensive than maybe like um looking for memory or something so there's so that, that one is gas so gas is not it's just um gas units now this gas price is like for each gas unit there is a price that is associated with each gas unit so now let's assume the price for each gas unit is like maybe 0 0.01 and for a particular transaction i'm spending twenty thousand gas so the total amounts that I'm going to spend on the gas for that transaction is the 20,000 gas units times 0 0.01, which is the gas, which is the price per gas. So I think that's clear. Um, one analogy that I always use to explain such things is the concept of if you are buying um like petrol, like gas to your to your car, there is 
Now, the, the, the amount of gas that you use for a, a particular distance will always be constant. So the same thing here, so if, if you are running the same function, the amount of gas that you use for the same function will always be constant. But now, the price that you buy your petrol will be different. You can buy it 200 naira today and tomorrow is 250. So the, so the gas price is the gas price is different. The gas price varies, depends on conjection, those lot of things. But the gas you need, the gas that you are spending, the gas you need that is for your transaction itself will always be different. But because the gas price differs, that means by the time you multiply it can differ. By the time you multiply the gas price by the gas units, even for the same function that you called, if you call the same function yesterday, I'm calling it today. If you are calling it today, you might end up spending more than you did yesterday if the gas price has increased. So I believe that is, that's clear enough. Now for the gas limit, it's just like um, the maximum amount of gas that you are sending. If you send a high gas limit, the transaction will you won't use up everything and then it will be refunded back to you. So that's like the gas limit. Most times you check, probably check the transaction on the task scan and you see everything. Can sometimes you may end up using just seventy percent of your gas limit. And all these things, if you are using a, a wallet like like MetaMask, all these things will be will be will be done for you. The gas price, the gas limit will be included for your do. You can also edit them if you want. If you sometimes if I'm doing some transactions and I see some gas price, I just edit it and reduce the gas price. So you can edit but it's just if the gas price is too low, the validators might not the transaction might not be validated. So you should always be careful so that you don't use the value that is too low. Now the two the two is just where you are sending the address to if for example if you are if you are trying to swap uh, an LT20 token be on Uniswap. So this two will be like the Uniswap router that you are using. Uh, so that's the two. And the value is if you are sending um now let's let's but now I'm talking about Ethereum blockchain. So if you are sending the native currency of it of Ethereum, which is Ether. If you are sending it out the transaction, maybe if you are sending it out to somebody, you are sending it out to your contract or something, the value is the amount of ether that you are sending. And this data, if you are following, if you are sending a transaction to an externally owned address, the data field can be empty. You can also add anything if you like, but the data field can be it's mostly empty if you are sending a transaction to an area. But if it's a contract, um if I even go for um, do you guys know the difference between a, con between a contract address and an externally owned address? Say an, external external an externally owned address, UA, and a contract address. Do you guys know um, what the main difference between the two? Mm, I think the contract address is like the, let's say the link or you need to assess a particular smart contract. Yes. Blockchain. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about an external user address? Okay, so there is there are contracts on the blockchain. So contract address is basically the contract address where the co a smart contract is located. So for those kind of contracts, that was, for those kind of addresses, it's a smart contract that is located here. If you call that address, whatever will happen will be determined by the code of the smart contract. And, um, which is different to an externally owned account. For an externally owned account, the, the address does not contain any any smart contract code. Anybody that owns the private key to that externally owned address can control it. For my address that I, that I have the private key, I can do anything, I can send value with it, it allows because I own the private key. So because I own the private key, I can use the address for anything I like. But for a contract address, there is no private key. What controls that contract is the contract code. So that's just the difference. An external unit address doesn't contain. You can only use an external unit address to just receive it as sent it You can There is no code or needs. It's just the basics. But for a contract address, that's the address where the contract lives. So that's the difference between the two. Uh, so I was saying for a data, the data field contains like. If you are following the particular function in a smart contract, this data field will contain the, the function, actually the function signature, but like data field will just contain like the, the function that you are calling on the smart contract, there's the argument to the function. That's what the data field contains. So the data, so this, this, this data that the EVM will use, it is the EVM that will, that, will, that will interact with the contract bytes code, it is the EVM that will want the bytes code. So it is this data. It is from this data field that the UVM will know which function for the smart contract they are calling. It is from the data field that the UVM will know the arguments that are passing to the function. 
that's what the data does and then this VROS is just has to do with um, the signature like um whenever anybody signs a transaction you are signing it with your private key so this VROS this VROS field just contains the component of the your signature so let's let's move yeah so if you are sending we are just sending it like okay i'm just sending it to somebody a lot of this thing the gas limit will be 21 so for ether transfer the gas that is spent is just 21,000 gas for ether transfer but if you are calling this part contract then it's going to be like this 21,000 plus whatever gas is required for the particular function that i'm calling so this two will just be the address that i'm sending data to and the data will be empty i said it's you know kind of like if you are just sending the value you are not sending it you are not calling this part contract address they are not doing anything, they are just calling an account and sending the value, they are just sending value to an account the data field will be empty the gas limit will be just be 21,000 because that's, that's the that's the thing that will be, that will be used next mm -hmm. I also mentioned this in that time let's just move on contract deployment um, all these things that I would like us to you know, maybe like create the contract with them is and deploy it and see something. So when you are deploying the contract, even even though you are technically not uh, sending a transaction to an address or something, but it's when you are deploying the contract, the the old um, transaction also also looks like that. So they are, they are doing a normal transaction. So the nonce is still the same thing. Okay now I was explaining nonce the other time like number of transactions from an from an account. That's for an EOE, an externally owned account. That's where the nonce is number of transactions that has been called that has been called from an account that's been completed. But if it is smart smart contract addresses also have their own nonce as well. But their own the nonce of a smart contract address is the number of contracts that this smart contract has deployed. Now let me come again. A smart contract can deploy another smart contract. An externally owned address as well can deploy a smart contract. So both an externally owned address and a smart contract can deploy it. Both of them can deploy smart contracts. So the nonce of the smart contract is the number of smart contracts that it has deployed itself. That's what the nonce is. Whereas the nonce of an EOA is the number of transactions that this address has completed. So, yes. so now we're talking about um, the transaction fields for a contract deployment. Now, if you are deploying the contract, this two is always empty. It's called an address zero. So, address zero is like, I don't know if you don't, for those that don't know, address zero is basically an address that nobody has a private key to. So, anytime something is sent to an address zero, we believe it has been destroyed <coughs> permanently. That's basically what address zero is. So, when you are deploying a smart contract, the two field is always empty you are not sending transactions to any contracts you are just or to any address you are just depending the contracts and the data contains the init code it's kind of the equation code of the contract state that's what the data contains and okay guessing why are we talking about this init code data yeah and if it's a function called same time display data time and the data field will be the code will be like the function signature the arguments to the function the arguments the function core yeah function core plus parameters so now let's talk more about the EVM GVM is a stack based processor and what that means is um a lot of competitions that happen on the EVM they happen on the stack what is the stack the stack is the data structure where where the um the last the last um value that's last last in last in first out so start um the last value that was added to this data structure will always be the first one to come out so whenever you are adding a value to the stack you are adding a new value you are adding value to the to the top of the stack so you are push that's what that's what push us probably from from a to push of the relation so when you when you see a push of code is an EVM of code and what that push does is it pushes the value to the top of the stack and if you see pop what pop does is pop takes a value removes the value from the stack and what and pop takes value from the top of the stack so basically when you are popping you are removing the value that was the value that was added the last value that was added that was well, that's what you are popping and if you are pushing also you are pushing a value to the top of the stack 
on like rather the top structures like two. So, yes. so now this this basically how we stack is average the um the stack for an EVM as um one thousand and twenty four like that's the total number of values that are that's like the stack length or stack size so, like you can have for a particular for an EV, for the EVM can have one thousand and twenty four values on the stack. So now this add of code, I mentioned this add of code here that time when I, when I was talking about gas, I said like the gear of the gas for this add of code is three, three gas units. So when you are adding, the add takes two of codes. So the add basically just take this, it, it, it pops this first, this seven from the start, pops it, then pops two or two from the start, and add both of them together. And afterwards, now it pushes this, the nine, pushes nine back to the stack. Although for it to be um won't um, this just an example you see the always do with exactness power value so you normal you never see like all these two all the values that you see there will always be will always be yeah will be of this form O X five so it's always going to be in X. So this shows to me the EVM EVM works. It uses start a lot. We are pushing, we are pushing to start, popping to start. Sometimes you perform we are performing some competition. You pop values from the stack and then you push the result of that computation back to the stack. That's so that's that's why they call it the stack based processor. It uses the stack a lot for a lot of these a lot of these computations. Um next one. Yeah, stack if they more cool copy from <coughs> So the code data also the code data is what is the it contains the data feed. The data feed I'll just take the parts now. Um, that's what that's all that's what is always in the code data the function signature and that's the then we have memory yeah we have memory we have storage code logs so um memory okay so memory is just is is different from the stack it's also yeah it's just sometimes especially when you are running a function call when you are running a function call you need to save data to memory and, so, and also like take the tap on memory as well and then storage storage now for each contract address now if you look at if you look at a contract address if you ever write the contract address before then you know that they always state variables and state variables are the value that are saved in the storage of the contract so this each each contract have their storage so this storage is this storage of the contract will always be it will always be there. It's it's not um it's not volatile. The storage will always so the storage is always something that of it. it's always something something that um it's now for for memory and core data after after introduction has finished running the whole thing is wiped they don't persist they do they are deleted so the memory is basically is going to be empty after the transaction and even the stack as well but this storage will always be there it's 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 on it's yeah the, 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 the storage the any value that has been stored in a smart contract storage will always be in the store or unless you delete it like unless maybe like there's a function in the contract that you can use to delete the contract or set it back to, to zero so this storage will always be there it is persistent that's why when i write it to storage the data the, the gas is always high because this because basically you are even writing to add drives Writing to people's computer to notes to uh, this storage would be, be these values will be will be stored on several notes across the world. So that's why it's always expensive whenever you're dealing with storage. We have code, we have logs. These logs are basically like the events, like the, the event logs. You should know events like um wait there with any events, those values will be in the logs. So yeah, so let's um how does the EVM yeah, so how does Ethereum like this is um Meku Patricia tree where it is the government guard state roads. So if you look at if you check through a block, we check through a block on, on maybe Tascan or something, you see several values the block and the parent hash, block number, timestamp, and you see this state root value as well. So this state root is like the hash now um okay. So this this state suit is like the as you can see how this how, how this values. So um this 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 is the data structure called Meku Patricia tree. And it's just it's just used to like store um account information on Ethereum. 
um, account the the balance the if the uh, data balance of an account the which token value data balance um, the this um, code yeah for contract addresses the code hash the storage it's basically this make Patricia tree that stores them so it stores them and ashes everything up to have this up to, up to the point so you have the state suit so this is the root of the make Patricia tree um if you really want to like know me about the tree i'll just advise maybe like read me about it after the class so it's quite it's complex that structure but so basically this 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 these are called the leaves the leaves just contains um I think it's it's a key value pair where the key is like the the address of an of an account that's the key and then it is mapped to so information depending the account it is mapped to uh, the account address I mean the account um, balance the address that balance the the contract if, if it's a contract the the code the contract price code and the the storage for that contract it's a contract so everything is everything is actually stored using this local Patricia tree and after and it's stored then it is hashed, hashed all the way up to we have like a state suit so this state suit is one that is always included in every block so yeah of storage values with the account where the key is it's which is a bit number so now we'll be looking at this is ethereum yellow paper <coughs> um we've never had a ethereum yellow paper before it's just um the part that, that describes how, how the protocol works, how the Ethereum protocol works. This guy is, it's this guy does of thing about the you know the EVM, the EVM upcodes and basically basically this is like the, the protocol that like explains all the specifications, everything about the Ethereum, Ethereum blockchain. Now these are some upcodes, these are some Ethereum, these are some EVM upcodes, and this is their values. So this is stop of code, add, multiplication, multiply, sub, div, sd, mode, f mode, add mode, a lot of lot of up codes. Yeah. So this is an example. <coughs> this is an example of a contract in, in solidity. And this contract has it has um, two state variables. That's a constructor and that's a function. And let me ask a question. After we deploy, if I should compile this smart contract and deploy it, how many functions will be there inside this contract? Does anyone have any idea? I can't see you. Hope you guys can see me. Can you? Okay, so I was asking a question. Does anyone have any idea? Okay, I'll just take it as as no then. No, this is this is the smart contract does a constructor a function set and plus some data functions for this for this value as well value one value two this function this code deploy yeah so um this constructor is just a function that is run um the very first time they are deploying the contract so whenever I deploy the contract the constructor code is one and the thing about this constructor is the 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 byte code aspect of this constructor is not always sent to the block like basically after only this constructor we are deploying and it resets in like this value to the tv this constructor is not always included in the contract's one time code because it's a constructor it's it's meant to only run the very first time you are creating a contract just to set up the contract state and all after that it will never run again 
So if you check off the contract on the first scan and you check the, the one time code, it will not include the constructor. It's because the constructor is the function that, that cannot be called again, can only be called once. So you see other functions inside the smart contract there, but this constructor will not be there. So in this function of this one here. So if you compare the function of the contract that we just saw now, this is the example of the bytes code that you have. So basically this is this bytes code is the um the EVM outputs and those are the values that the EVM code has. So um basically if you look at this byte code, it might not really make much sense. I mean definitely won't make much sense without all these values, but these are the kind of values that the EVM works with and the EVM understands how to output these these values. And so this init code is basically the the constructor code. So this so this 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 aspect that shows the init code is like the constructor code. So after this constructor code finish after it has after it has been executed, this other aspect is the one type code which contains other functions apart from the constructor. Other other function function implementation apart from the constructor. So um after this this constructor um, code as run, it returns this one time code and this is the one one time code that will be that you see on chain. If you are checking the bytecode of your contract on on a task card, since this is one time code that you see there, you won't see this init code which is the constructor, you won't see there's just basically this one time code. So whenever you are deploying a contract here, yeah, the two address is not specified. The data is the init code fragment here. Yeah. So this yeah, data is the init code fragment. Exactly. The init function basically the constructor is not stored on the blockchain. So let's, let's move on. So basically what this um sys C0 is a wood does is just uh, if, we, if we check, um, I showed the yellow paper that we saw the, the other time, we will check the EVM upcodes. Then you see that this 0x, 0x60 stands for the push upcode. So basically what this 6080 means is just push. This 60 stands for the for the push upcode. And basically so just push 80 to the stack. So this will H C zero zero C zero four zero is just like creating a few memory pointer on the start before we start executing the con the constructor code. So let's just let's just push to uh, basically push zero x zero push this. So this this are the so those bytes code that we just saw now. This this bytes code uh and um they become this this opcode and this is the opcode if you have actually wants these are the opcodes that the that the EVM understand. Um, then we push, push one, m store, core value is zero, push, there are a lot of EVM upcodes and those are the upcodes that the EVM use. So it is the EVM that would that would run a smart contract code. Anytime you're calling a contract, so it is the EVM that will run the contract code and like dictate the next things that the Ethereum blockchain is is going to. So that's that's the code. Basically, so push, push your word onto the stack. Yeah, I mentioned this at that time and stack as a maximum bit of 1024. So basically there can only be 1024 words in the stack for a particular transaction. So stack zero is the balance of stack stack one. Push one, push the bytes for the yeah. So this just basically describe what this what these opcodes are doing. Story button. Free memory pointer. So what these three opcodes are just doing is just um, if a female movie pointer, yeah, female movie pointer, and female movie pointer is just basically allocating like okay, these are the this is the portion of the memory that is free that can be called if, if you need to call the memory core value here, yeah, the core value contains um, the amount of way or eta of eta that was sent to the contract. So let's just let's just push through. Okay, yes. So 
basically this is just describing um how how a function call how the EVM interprets a function call. So if you are calling a function on the smart contract, how does the EVM um know which particular function you are calling? How does it interpret the function? How does it um, execute the smart contract logic? So um I'm not sure how to push through this function selector. So we're talking about I think I mentioned the function selector the other time now. Uh, these are the values as always as well as always included in the data of a, of a transaction. So um the function selector is just the first four bytes of the code that a function of course. So um when we have a function, for example, look at this function now we have the name of the function is set. And this set takes an arg, it takes a, a parameter, that's a parameter which is a unit 256. And then the function just sets set this storage variable to, to this argument that has been passed. <clears throat> so the function signature of this particular function is the name of the function which is set, this is it, and the parameter type which is unit 256. So sets unit 256. So uh, the hash of this value. The first four bytes, okay, let's just, let's just take the hash of this value is basically like the function signature. So, um, in the data, if you check the data of the function code, you won't see set u in, set u into five system. What you see is like the hash of this of this value and the first four bytes of that hash. That's what you that's that's, that's always the first four values of a function of a of a transaction data and then the remaining value will not be like the argument. So then the after the folks the first four bytes of the transaction. The third mini value that you see there is is this argument, whatever it is being passed as the param. So um let's just actually write some code with VMX actually. Because um I feel this class might be getting this big boy fast. I'm also getting bored myself. So this was the um the RC20 contract that we that we wrote. I don't know for anybody who's having it before that um, building your cryptocurrency class. This was the RC20 contract that we wrote. For mm, let's just use something basic for this example. This is not basic as well. How to just create I just create a very, very small and minimal contract just to see something I'm um, talking about burning the byte code and the EVM opcodes. So, contract plus. Now let's create just a single storage variable. In state variable, and this. Function should be a public function. And the standard function we just do the same thing as well. Let's go 
look then as the following class is anybody there? Yes, okay. okay so now let's deploy this contract with, with Phoenix. when we compile the contract we will check the compilation details then we can see uh, i talked about the abi at the other time but like it contains exactly so okay let me just copy this and paste it so so this is the api of this contract that i've just i just created as you can see it just basically describes the the functions that are in the contract and anytime you you are writing um an application um if you are creating a front end for your contract, an interface will be put to interact with your contract. You always have to use this API whenever you are creating an instance of the contract because this API is needed for the for the interface, the task years or web they are using for it to like understand the interface of the contract, the functions that are contained. On. So we look at this 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 describing the constructor that we have it does not pay you doesn't take any arguments that's why there's no inputs here if, if, if it was taking an argument and you see the argument side is inputs input array so um, next this one describes this function as well this is its name set owner the function it is not payable as well um, this is the input value it is not take, if it was taking an argument then those arguments will be here in the input and this no returning anything as well that's why this output is empty um, the, can anyone like tell me like the what this non-payable means? If I say this function is not payable, does anyone have any idea what it means? I think it means that uh, we're not charged for the transaction. Yeah, not charged for the transaction. Right. It's not no uh, any any transaction that occurs on the Ethereum blockchain, we have to pay gas for all the transactions that occur. So there is no way you will not be charged for each transaction okay so what this non payable means is fine there is there is gas now when, when we don't talk about being charged for each transaction as you pay gas when you pay that gas the that now if you are calling you will deploy these contracts on the chain and record these contracts the gas that are paying is not coming to these contracts no the gas is being paid to the validator validator is like um so um, Ethereum was a pool of stake currently it is a pool of work for example pool of stake. So my is the validator is, is the side person who who validates this transaction, who increases this transaction in the block. So it is a validator has to like validate this transaction before it can be included in the block and then afterwards we broadcast all over the Ethereum network. For let's just say for a transaction to go successfully, someone has to validate it. And it is the person that validates it that gets the gas fee that you are paying. So it's not coming to the contract. But let's assume there's a situation where you want to actually send the value to this contract. Uh, maybe you want to deposit it out to this contract, or you want to do something that has to that you have to send value. That's when we set this contract to pay. If we make it pay, that means anytime you are calling this function, you can send value to it. And we can access whatever value was sent using something like msg.value. So this msg.value contains the value that was sent with, to this function. So you can get, so that means now you are sending the value to this contract this time around. Unlike the gas that is not being sent to the contract, you can send the value. So that's what this non payable is not. So if I, if I don't set this function as payable, if you try and send value to this, to this function, it is going to revert. The transaction, the transaction will not go through because I don't I didn't mark it as payable. So this function will not be able to receive it up. But if I set well, I if I send to payable, then if you are calling this function, you can send value, you can send it up to the function. To the function, I mean I know that's clear. But let me just remove this. So now this there's the API. But so this is a function. If I add a lot of functions, then everything will be described inside this area. So let's let's check the bytes code, which is like a major thing that we need. Yeah, there's, there's the bytes code, there's the non-time code. So 
And you've got to be this as well so we can see it. <laughs> so this 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 is the byte code for this contract. And see it's, it's quite it's, it's, it's a lot. So this is the byte code for the contract, and this is these are the opcodes. So basically, it's just the byte code that becomes the opcode. So this opcode contains um the 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 EVM opcode. So it's just basically what I just what I explained the last time where this six zero top is is referring to the push opcode. So this six zero becomes the push opcode. So basically push. 0x80 to the stack. Now this is also if to be push, push 0x40 and so on. The core value M store. So it's just it's just this this up this um byte code. It's just the same thing as this up code, but it's the actual up code. This is the actual thing that is interpreted by the this is the actual thing that is that the EVM understand and this is the what this so this is the contract byte code. This is the contract code. So whenever um so anybody send a transaction to this contract. This is what the EVM will work with. This is the code that EVM will work with. So I found that is so what the system is not enough interest. Not enough interest here. Mm -hmm. I can't see anything. Okay. So I'll uh, start with the let's check that scan for some transactions and then also that we can see. So this it has scan. I want to assume we all know what task can is what we don't. It's just a block explorer where we can see everything that is going on, all transactions that are, that are going on on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, transactions, block, everything we can see them. So these are the test transactions that we mind. If we look at this transaction, so just things that we went through the other time. Um, the block, the block of the transaction, the timestamp, the time when the transaction, when the block was validated. So, from this is the person that sent the transaction, and two, this is the the recipient of the transaction. I don't know if the contract address or not. I think the contract address. So this is like the the address. This is the contract address of the person that is being called. Value. So like I said, so this value represents basically the MSG dot value. That I wrote for that I wrote now recently. That I wrote now. So this MSG dot value. So this value is just like the value that has been sent to this function call. And now there's the now there's the gas the gas price. I I, I mentioned the gas price to be like the the price the price in which okay now this one is in which so um we and we are like a, a subunit of eta. Um, we is 10 with power minus 18 eta and we is 10 with power minus 9 eta. So this is we. So this is now currently this is like the, the gas price. So the price for each unit of gas. This is the comment price. And then you can see the gas. Uh, the gas limits like the maximum gas. So as you can see, only 94 94.59 percent of this gas limit was actually used. So that means the other ga the gas that, did, that wasn't used to be sent back. To, the, to this form address and we have the gas fee so this is the data field so this doesn't even have any data field so does that mean this mm -hmm. is not a that means this it doesn't have any data field that means this two is not a contract yeah if it was a contract then it has to have a data field yeah so let's check let's, let's check up this block as well So a block basically just contains several transactions. Um, that's actually where the name blockchain was actually derived. A chain of blocks. So um, on Ethereum, I think every 12 seconds a new block is created. And the block contains like a lot of transactions. Now this particular block, block number 169.1327 has one of three transactions. And all those transactions are included in the block. 
So now we're talking about the gas fee. So whoever it is that validated that validated this block will be like the recipient of the gas fee. So this is the total gas used for this block. Yeah, this is the total gas used, and the, the validator of this gas will be the one to receive the gas fee. And there's the state rules that was explaining it up then, like the the roots of that microparticle tree that contains like all that, that stores information on the Ethereum blockchain, that stores the the account address, the account balance, the the irritated contract, the contract code, the contract storage, and everything. So this is like the hash of the whole value, like the the roots of everything. So it's always included in each block. So let's check. Oh, please, if you have any question, please feel free to ask your question to the artists. Just to be a bit interactive. I'll see that here. So, okay, so let's let's go back to our. So these are the, like the kind of your codes that we just saw. Now, if I have to jump the rest. Code it as So this like uh, I'm talking about the function signature at that time. So for a particular function, this is the signature, and then the hash of this signature is this basically like the first four bytes. And one byte is, is two hexadecimal, so that's how we have its values. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is the first byte. The six, seven is the first byte. The FE is the second byte. Four, seven is the third byte, and B1 is the fourth byte. So this is like the function. This is what, this is the function signature, and this is the hash of the function signature. Just describing the upcode. So this. When the uh, EVM is one of this upcode, this is basically how it is um, stepping through each upcode and running them. Sometimes you have to jump, that's like jump to another location, push, you have to load core data, S -tom is it's so it's, it's saving to storage. So, okay, let's see, I'm not sure if we're using. Yeah, so we talked about the payable function. Let's talk about the payable function now. For this one, uh, the payable function allows it to be transferred to a contract as if it were an EOE. If someone is sending part of the contracts and the book code transaction, it has to still accept the transfer to be. So, which layout? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the storage layouts then. Let's talk about storage layouts. So inside the contracts, one will create this these state variables. Uh, the storage layouts of the EV of the contract um I don't just get this. The task is not okay. So it's the one oh, talking about the contract storage. How 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 the smart contracts store? How uh, is the how is their storage implemented? Now, the, for each for each smart contract, the, each smart contract has their own, they have their own storage. So, um, the storage, there are, there are slots. There are something called slots. The storage is like a key a key value mapping, right? Where you have a key, and with that key, you can retrieve whatever value was stored at that at the contract at that key, at that particular. Um, contract storage. So if you have the key, you can retrieve whatever value was stored at that point. So now for this, for this particular contract, our storage is always set up based on 32 bytes worth. That is for each each slot, each slot can contain 32 bytes. So now this unit 256 means mm -hmm. with this is bits 32 bytes. So that means now for this. I think it was wrong. Explained. Yeah. So now this storage two bytes forward. Blah blah blah. Now for this byte, I mean this byte should be stored at at slot zero 
for this for the contract layout this 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 part is the first is the first state variable right and it will be stored at um slots at index zero so that zero is the key so every time we need to retrieve this this value this uh, value part value we, we need to call the smart contract the evm will access the smart contract storage and the evm will access the, the the value at the zero at the slot zero and then we will retrieve the value part and then this value in 256 should be stored at the slot one of the smart of that particular contract storage so we have so now this um set each each storage slot is to is set to bytes right so uh this one will take up one one slot take off slot zero this one will take off uh, slot one because it is set to bytes two if this is bit it's set to bytes one one byte is eight bits so this is set to bytes as well it's take up the second storage slot which is slot one for this one if you look at this this is us 32 This is U in 32, um, U in 64, and address. If we add up this 32, 32 plus 64 gives us 96 plus address. That's an address is, is a 20 byte value. So basically, the point is because these three values now, these three values can, can fit in a single storage slot. Because addition of now this unit value it, it needs only text two bits. That two bits is eight bytes. Okay, let, let me just stick to you know, let me stick to let me stick to bits from now on so that I understand. So this uh, we set this, the, the slots, the storage set up on text two bytes and that's the fifty six bits. From now on I won't use this byte again. I'll be using the bits to fifty six bits that's for the storage. Now this value this unit five six will take up a O a whole slot of 36 bits so it's going to take up a whole slot but now this one is just at two bits now this after storing it has to after storing this value inside the, the next the next slot which is slot slot two this one is taking this one is in slot zero this one is in slot one now after saving storing this value in 32 inside the, the slot two that's like the so there's still more because it is, it is just 32 bits and these slots can take up to 256 bits. So we will not first store this as two bits. We still have like extra to to 24 where we can still store value. So, so that means we can still we can as well still store this value also this during 64. So we can store it to that same slot as well. And also this address also can be stored to the same slot because it will the, the, the data required the the, the data required by both by, by these three values, like the total bits required by these three values, are not to this is bits. Mm -hmm. So you can store the three of them in a single storage slot and to fit in. In fact, there will still be there will still be space to even add more values to. So this next value is a U256. This one is to take because it's it's a full U256. There is no way if we try and put it here, then it will fit. So that's why I was like create a new. It doesn't stay in its own slot separately. So uh, I need to be a bit convincing or just let's see maybe this. Like I need to use it. I want to say it's possible we can go by it again, please. Okay, so I think it should be clear. It should this 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 illustration should make it clear. Now let me start again. Okay. Um, whenever you call, whenever we deploy the contracts, the contracts will be deployed. The the contracts byte code that we that we've seen that we've seen multiple times. Will be stored. Everything will be stored on. Okay, there are now. Where are these things stored? There are there are several nodes across the board. This anybody can run a node. You can I can start to run a node on my system, but it's just you node know, requirement for it because it's always like your, your PC has to be like very very it has to be high specs for each one a node. That's like the requirement. Right. So for everyone running a node as a copy, if they're running a full node. Yeah, you can only full you can only like so if you're only the full node you have a copy of all the data that is on ethereum blockchain all the smart contracts all the contracts uh, contract balance contract storage everything is on your node and because there are a lot of nodes i think i was saying like maybe around 500,000 plus so that means basically like 500,000 systems where the same data that's why that's why we say ethereum is centralized because 
Even if something happens to one node, the same data is on several nodes across the world. So it's impossible for somebody to say, okay, let me take down the nodes or something. So the, all these contract storage are actually saved on several nodes, on several nodes across the world. So this each contract. So we deploy these contracts initially, because if we deploy it, the first time we deploy it, all these values will be set to zero and everything. But this, these values need to be arranged in a contract slot, in a contract storage. And how would, how would these state variables now? How would these state variables be arranged in a contract storage? For the for your contract storage, it has different slots. So let's just let's take it as a key a key value here. Let's assume something like a mapping a key value here. So with if not, if I want to get this this value this value by the value now, this value by is saved somewhere on this contract storage. How will I know where it is saved? How will I know where this value with two is saved? How will I know where these values are saved? Now, that's that's where the concept of storage location comes. Now, for this storage, there are several. It has several storage locations: storage location zero, storage location one, storage location storage location three. Now, this now each each storage location has a maximum size of fifty six bits. That's the maximum size I can hold. 256 bits. So it cannot hold if the 256 bits is like the highest. Um, unless you're using dynamic data size, but let's just there is no that value that is above 256 bits. So for every storage, uh, for every value that you are storing, it's going to one of these storage locations. So how do we know where this value byte is located? How do we know if it's located in storage location 0 or storage location 1 or storage location 2 or 3 or something? Because this value byte is the first. Um, this is the first state variable that we declared. And these bytes will use up, this byte data type will use up a whole 256 bits. So this file bytes will be stored on storage location 0. This value in 256 also will use, because it's a U in 256, it also requires a full 256 bits. This one has taken up this, the whole 256 bits of the storage location 0, there is nothing left again. This one too requires a photo of this bit so to be stored at the at storage location one. Now this this unit 32 is just two bits. I will set the maximum the maximum that a, a, a storage can put up to 56. The maximum um, value that can load is like a 256 bits. Can load up to 256 bits value. But this one is just a two bits, which means after we store this value, after we store this value in 232. That the storage location zero. There is still more. There is, there, is, there is still space for us to add the another value again because it's just a unit thirty two. It has not used up the whole two fifty six bits of the storage location. So this one will be stored here. This one is also sixty four as well. Sixty four plus thirty two is ninety six. It's not even close to the at all. So we store this value in sixty four two and storage location two also. An address is just 20 bits. Yeah, an address is just a 20 bit. It's just a that's a 20 bits. No, uh, I mean 20 bytes. So that's 166 bits. 160 bits, I mean. So an address is a 160 bit value. But even if we add 160 plus 64 plus 32, it's still not going to be more than 256. That would just be maybe make 256 exactly or something or close to that. So there's still space for us to add this 160 bit value as well. So we can add this address to be added to this storage location too. That means anytime we need to retrieve, anytime the EVM needs to retrieve this value in 32, it's going to call storage location two. Anytime it needs to retrieve this value in 64, it's going to call the same storage location two. Anytime it needs to retrieve this value address also, it's going to call the storage location two mm -hmm. as well. And why it goes like differentiate between these those values since they are already in the same spot, that's why it's going to use the offsets. But it's not going to that one for now. And now this value is a full unit 256 on its own as well. So that means to take up this storage location 3. If we have another state variable here, as down will take up storage location 4. So depending on the size, my, that's where if you ever add something about storage packing, this way this is really the concept of storage packing. So basically, we'll pack these three variables inside these same slots. It's always a good idea to like um, pack because. All this storage you are paying 
Anytime you need to access a storage, a storage value, you are paying a lot of gas fees. It's quite expensive computationally to access um, storage and to like save to storage. Anything storage related is always expensive. So it's, it's our best interest if we are um, if able to pack several um, state variables inside the same storage slots. Now, let me try and go to something. I have a question. So, the first question is when you have bytes, private, private bytes, yeah. I'm wondering why, why, why are you using bytes? You see that you're just trying to, you're just trying to actually explain the concept to us. Because I feel that like you see, you can actually also use a BU in 256 instead. Yes, yeah, so that works. Okay. Well, you should. So it depends on um, whatever you are you want to hold. So in this kind of case, you into you into five six would have worked as well. It depends on what you are holding. As sometimes, manage to actually hold a byte value. So that one, you use byte for it. If you need to hold a string, if you need to hold a string value, then you have to use string. If you need to hold uh, a boolean, you can use bool. So they are different. So you just use any any that type that fits whatever you want to do the most that's what you use so this byte is just uh, just for explanation you can use if you feel these by bytes would if you feel the u in two five six will work as well then you can as well use it there is no problem about that so okay. then, then my second, second question, question is where, where you have, have the address, address private. private yeah so, so is it like um, um in the, like, like in the, the documentation, is like address, address that's, that's part, this particular, particular keyword address, address automatically assumes the value of u in uh, 160. 160. Or because I'm not using address, instead of using maybe u in 64, u in 128. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you can use address in that type. Is is always you said about which would an address. You might need to put an address on your smart contract. Like like we did the contract that I just wrote now, we, we had an address that was holding um that, that was used to like store the, the contract deployer. So an address data type is always used to to store an address. It can be a contract address or an externally owned address. So that's what this address is always used for. To so store an address, uh, any value that is going to be an address. As well, this address that we just would. So I said it's it's a one sixty bit because um if you check your inom your address contract address or or external unit um accounts if you count the value that, that the the address that you see it will probably be in um hexadecimal. So you apart from remove the zero x this zero x is not part of any time you see zero x here. It's always part of the value. This, this, the, the work of the zero x is just to like, um, it's just to tell us that this value is an hexadecimal. So it's just this OX just tells us it's an hexadecimal value. So if you look at your address, if you move the OX from the address, you would have like 40 values. You count 40 characters. So an address in hexadecimal is 40 characters. If you convert the same hexadecimal, if you convert the same hexadecimal to bytes. You end up having 160 characters. That's why I said this address, um, it's 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 a 160. It's it's it's, it's the address. The any value that is in, that is stored in an address is going to be of is going to be of of uh, size 160 bits because that is the size of an address in Ethereum and other EVM blockchains. So the one address is 160 bits. Is that clear? Or do I need to go back again? That's clear. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so I'm, I'm trying, trying to check, check more, more, but I'm trying. Check, my, I think I need to read more and understand, more and understand um, the, different the different data types. types. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can so, you can do that. So any data type you use, you just depend on whatever you need. If you need to hold an address type, you use this address. If you need to hold a U eight, depending on the size of the U eight, you then there this is can depending on the size of the U eight. That's all. Determine if you are going to use a unit two five six or unit six or unit eight or unit one six depends on the size of the unit, and there are different types of pool despite strings as well. So let's just um, yeah. So that's like how how the storage contract is always read out. 
Oh, yeah, we will count chance. And like this, like this, like this. And that up code. So this, this, uh, this, this is just like the up code that. Yeah, so this is just the part code that describes these contracts. So let's go. No storage with mask. Oh, blah, blah, blah. So these are some other data types as well, bytes and string. So bytes and string, as we all know, uh, we will the same, same, actually a string, even from other programming languages, rather than a string, think in JavaScript, a string is always felt like an, like an array, kind of, like an array of values. So because it's a string, we don't know the length of the string. It can be, a string can be 10, it can be 20 characters, 50 characters, so that's what they mean by variable length. There's no way we can fix a, a length to a string because we don't know the length that is, we don't know the value, the length of that string. So it's always a variable length, which means it can, it can be of any length. The same thing with this byte also. Unless we are using, we are using something like a byte 1, byte 32, byte skin, and those ones are fixed. But for this byte, it's also variable, it's also a variable length as well. Yeah, so this is just byte push. Let's just keep going. The upcode that describe. Mm -hmm. So we can create an array data type as well, and these are create arrays in Solidity. The type of the array. If you use something like JavaScript, then um, arrays in JavaScript can hold values of different types. You can hold a string, a number, um, a pool, a floating point. But for Solidity, each array has to be like, it can only contain a data type. So for this unit 5 6 array now, you can't put a byte there, you can't put an address or a string there. It has to be only a unit 2, 5, 6. Same thing with these bytes arrays as well. You can only contain a byte. Can add any other data type apart from these bytes as well. So we must. And the way the storage of the contract is laid out for an for an RV and muffins is kind of different. And I'm not sure I'm going to go into that because it's kind of more complicated than others um, fixed others um, what they call them. But all those uints um, address it's it's different the way. The storage is data for 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 an array arrays mapping stroke are different from um UINs, address and plus other data types. So mapping as well. Let's keep doing movie. It shows the respond. So this are just some, um, mm -hmm, yeah, comments, let's get it, yeah, so I'm not talking about memory also, memory is just like a, a data location, we've, we've talked about the spark, we've talked about the storage, and memory also is another data location as well, and same thing with spark, a memory, uh, the data in memory doesn't persist, after the execution of the, con of the transaction, um, the data is the, the memory is always like cleared off. So any value that is memory is, is actually lost after the execution of the data. So the data is stored that actually persists. That's when I actually stored permanently. So this is just memory. And memory is always used. Um, the arguments to a function are always stored in memory. Or it can be called data as well. But most function arguments are always copied to memory. Same thing, the return, if, if the function is returning something as well, so most times also is always in memory. So that's one big um, function of memory, old data, old uh, function arguments, and the return type as well. Code copy. So yeah, I think at this point, you can just, you can skip, you can skip this. And skip this. Let's just go to the summary. So memory temporary data store within a transaction. 
storage is persistent, it's not temporary. The code, that was the base code of the contract. Logs, which contains the events, and so on. So let's just think this is all for now from this. That was, that was a lot. That was a lot. So if you've got any question or anything that you like, like, like to ask regarding this class or anything regarding solidity or team in general, let's just let's go. If you got any question, please let me know. Okay, so there's no question. Yes, so, um, I'm actually trying to, I have a question to ask actually. So, um, I'm just implementing uh, using implementation of the EVM. When you mentioned the storage, and so I'm wondering, I, I, I know like NFTs probably have to use the EVM and stuff to work and probably. Using this, um, the way you just implemented it, you, you want to do it that you could probably work. So, I'm so wondering where exactly is the data stored? Yeah, I mentioned this. I said, I, I mentioned something about nodes. Like, um, at West. Do you remember what I said about nodes? Yes. Like, so, where, like, storing data on different. Well, I get what you meant about it, but, but like, and in the concept of maybe like in the normal way, two applications. Yes. So, if you're going to implement like a database, you probably want to use a normal DDB or a yes. 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 And then, so, so like, in the concept of. Okay. Continue your question, please. Yes, yeah, so like, so in using an EVM now, you are going to write a smart contract and you want it to also store data. Yes. Okay, so, um, this is how it works. When you write your smart contracts and you deploy, when you actually deploy, what actually happens on the Ethereum network is your, tra your deployment transaction is always is, is sent you it's always sent to to a node and it's always like it's going to be broadcast all around all the nodes so a node is i don't know if you know what nodes are but a node is just um okay a node is running an ethereum and a pressure of an ethereum client basically um everything regarding ethereum all the data uh, or any all the smart contract, all the data on Ethereum network is always in is all is always on um stored on a node. So now you're talking about a web database like probably the MongoDB or something. But the point something about web database is that MongoDB after you like um, maybe deploy it, I mean okay. after you host it on a server somewhere or something, that's the only that's the only single um that's the single location of that database so if anything happens and the database is down or you remove it then it is gone permanently but for a web but for a web thing a web three database web three application this data is not just located in a single location it's located on several locations so if if anything happens to some to be node somewhere or somebody's pc somewhere it is on it is still on several nodes across the world. So there is almost no way you can say that data was put down or it was censored or something because this and it's always the same data. So when you deploy the contract, yeah, because the, the contract the transaction is going to be sent to 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 a node and it's going to be broadcast around all, all the nodes in the world. And then when it is broadcast and everything, basically you um, once your transaction has been released and everything, all the nodes in the world will hold data for your smart contracts. You will hold the smart contract blind code, you will hold all the data that the contract is holding. So anytime now you are talking about an NFT like this, so let's anytime you are meeting a NFT, what are the changes that will happen on the smart contract? Um let's assume the data supply would the total supply of the contracts would, I mean, the total supply would increase. Uh, maybe like the ID would increase as well. Maybe set the metadata of the of this thing. So once, so 
Um, there's, there was a space before, before you send your transaction, there was a space where your NFT contract are let's assume the start supply of the NFT was 10. So the, the previous, so the, the, the total supply of the NFT was 10. Since that 10 that is on all the nodes in the world, your, your smart contract storage card and um, total supply of 10. But immediately you mean the total supply will increase by 1. Which that that the total supply increasing by one would have been coded in the smart contracts, right? So after you send the transaction yeah. and the EVM is running, so this EVM, I'm talking about EVM as well. This EVM is basically running on each of those nodes. They all have their own EVM, they have the expectation of the EVM. So each of the so this EVM is on each of those nodes as well. So when you mint the NFT and the total supply is this okay. node, these server nodes, the EVM on these server nodes will run the contract code and will increase your and will increase the supply value. So that will, according to what was written in the smart contract code, that once you meet the power supply is meant to increase by one. Yes. These nodes will alter your contract states as well and will increase the supply value by one as well. So these all the nodes will run this code and it's going to increase. And your own state changes that need to happen, everything that needs to be done will be done on each of those nodes. So when you are trying to get the data, let's assume you are just trying to like connect your smart contracts and get the data. That's why if you, you are running any data function, it doesn't cost gas because you are just getting the data. All you are using is just connect to a node, connect to a node. We use if you are using very well, things like Alchemy or Infura. So these are node providers. So your alchemy just connects to a node, just to a single node, <coughs> and it fetches data that you need from your smart contract. It doesn't need to connect to all the nodes in the world. It only connects to a single node because we are like each node are meant to con are meant to like have the same data of the Ethereum blockchain. Each every node are meant to like contain the same data. If any transaction that is, that is that is running is running on all the nodes, all the nodes are going to one same transaction. And they will change all the states that are meant to be changed, everything that are meant to be changed. So if you need to fetch a data from your from your smart contract, you connect to a node and will fetch data from the node. Well, if you need to like perform your transaction where you are changing states, then basically like it will be broadcast around all the nodes in the world and every and they will all run the code and like change your contract states. I guess that's uh, I have modeled up something, but that's just like the basics of how it works. I hope it's a bit clear when I'm after that. Somehow, I, I get what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, Unami. Um, yes. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. That was, that was good. So, um, yeah. Your question, who would be the question? Okay, so the, the question I asked initially was just based on the storage concept that I explained. So I was wondering, like, okay, in the case of an NFT, I know mean, that like, maybe like if you were using maybe like a Web2 application and you're going to create files and store data, like real data, maybe like pictures, username and other stuff. I know you want to implement like a MongoDB or maybe a MySQL to store your data or if I put in a flash or so. But I'm so only like in, in, the concept, in the concept of Web3, so where would data be stored is uh, in that same we're going to implement the database. Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, that's your question. So I think um in terms of NFT is now we have to look at it from two angles. Right? Okay. So before we go to the particular case of NFTs, let me look at it generally. Like I mentioned with two. Hey, you know. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, like you mentioned, Web 2, um, the data is stored in a MongoDB database to be hosted on centralized server, some of can be the BS. Right? So, that they can consider two components, the centralized server, the database which stores the data. So, if we are looking at it generally from a Web 3 now, or uh, thinking, okay, there are any of these smart contracts. We just look at it like that's um centralized database, let's say it's AWS now, is equivalent to 
a node, like an animation, is equivalent to a node. Right. So the centralized terminal that it is, is equivalent to the node. But the actual storage that lives on that centralized database, which is equivalent to the MongoDB, is going to be the storage of that particular NFT contract. Right. So the way it works in, is that we have, you can have different contracts. You can have um, crypto coin, and we have board apes, for instance. Now, so the board apes have their own particular storage which exists on the Ethereum blockchain. And um, what is it? Crypto coin have their own particular storage which exists on the Ethereum blockchain. So the, the way it works is that each contract has its own storage. Right. It has its own storage that exists on the Ethereum blockchain, and each node runs that Ethereum blockchain. So that is the way it works. And each smart contract now, as I already mentioned, each smart contract has its own storage and runs on and it's on the Ethereum blockchain. So the EVM, right? The place where the EVM comes in is that the EVM is like a is like a computer that exists, right? So the EVM. Is part of the Ethereum blockchain. What it does is that it allows us to do to store that data on the node. So it processes all our transactions that allow us to update that storage, make changes to that storage, delete, update, create, create new storages, remove old storages, and all that kind of stuff. So the equivalent of that MongoDB, right, is going to be the contract storage, which is just a part of other storages. That live on the blockchain and are controlled by the EVM. She gets you get that part. So for the NFT storage, you know, for the NFT storage, the way the NFT storage works is that NFT, for instance, um, we have. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. For NFT, for instance, we have token IDs. Uh, you have to, each NFT has a token ID. Each NFT contract has a total supply. It has a, um, a list of token IDs. It has a mapping of um, address to token ID. Uh, so those are like the. It has a. Um, it has something called URI. Uh, it can have a um, base URI, which is like the the base URI of all images that are on that NFT smart contract. Right. Uh, Actually, you are getting what I'm, what I'm saying. So the way to do for that NFT storage now, for instance, is that the, the total supply, which is the number, will be in the storage of the NFT. The base URL, which is the URL of all the images, will be in the storage of the NFT. Then um, the mapping of each owner to their token ID will be in the storage of that NFT. Now, the, the, if you are thinking of it, it from the angle of NFT. The actual picture of the NFT will not be stored on the blockchain. I'm just, I'm just saying in a basic way now, because there are ways that you can, you can still uh, generate images on uh, blockchain. This is what I call generative uh, NFT. We have forgotten the exact thing. So that, that's the way it works generally. So that base URL is a URL basically. So um, it links when you put it in your browser, it will link to the actual image which is stored on um, which can be stored centrally or it can be stored in a decentralized store in you know, a different decentralized storage like IPFS or um what is the popular one. Um what did you say? I'm with I'm not sure Yes, exactly how we so you can store the IP or how you, you do get that part. So the image itself is not stored in the storage longer. Yeah. Do you get the explanation? Is that fine? Yes, I yes, 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 it is. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm, any other question? No, no, not for me. Okay, cool. Right. So I guess the summary of this class is just um Ethereum um there is there's a current state and for the states of this of, of of for the states to to move to another new state it moves to another new state when the EVM processes a transaction. That's the way the EVM is going to like update the storage of the state of the contract. So 
once if then process the transaction, then the transaction, I mean, the Ethereum moves from its previous state to another new state. Okay, that's basically like something of your class. Um, if there is no other question, I don't know if you are maybe not sure or Noel has anything to add for like quality. Um, non -search. Okay, cool. So, I guess we can put the question on the class. So, thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, I mean, I didn't even know if I was going to take this long. I was thinking it was going to be like one hour or something. But I guess we are most of the So, yeah, thanks for attending the class, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks as well. So, yeah.